Good afternoon, and welcome to the final webcast for our virtual event, sharing the story of the U.S. military through the camera lens. My name is Midshipman Third Class Nathaniel Cash, and I'm excited to introduce Jess Atkinson and Joe Schreiber, filmmakers at Three Penny Films, who are going to peel back the curtain for a live, interactive, after-action critique of one of their own short films based right here at the United States Naval Academy. Jess Atkinson, the session moderator, is the original creative genius behind Three Penny Films. After both a career in professional football and in the TV industry, he realized teams were not having their story told in a compelling way. So, Jess taught himself to shoot, edit, and create content with authenticity and with heart. Today, he will help you learn to do the same. Joining him is producing legend Joe Schreiber, with decades of experience, he has truly revealed the hidden gems, the meaning within the sporting world's greatest moments and especially within the lives of its athletes. Participants, you are encouraged to join today's discussion and ask questions throughout. At the workshop's conclusion, we hope you are inspired to create your own short film. And with that, over to you, Jess and Joe. Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. I'm Joe Schreiber, along with my colleague, Jess Atkinson. I want to thank Midshipman Cash for that kind and <laughs> very humbling uh, introduction. Got a few housekeeping items we want to take care of before we start. Uh, first of all, I want to make this the best viewing experience for you. And there is a handout available in the uh, resource panel. It's on the left side of your screen, so you can click on that. A PDF will pop up. It'll actually pop up in a separate tab. So if you access it and read the tips, you want to click back to this tab here for the actual uh, webinar. So we will allow time for some Q&A throughout this presentation and afterwards. And we really encourage you to make this uh, an interactive experience. So don't be bashful with the Q&A as we go through the presentation. I'll be monitoring it as our director of the film, Jess, takes us through um, a presentation today. And we want to encourage you to make a film of your own. That's the whole point of this. And at the end of the webinar, we'll tell you about a contest and a film festival um, that you can enter. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available at about one day after the webinar. And you can use the same link that you access this webinar to get to the webcast. All right, so we want to get started. And the way we're going to start is we're going to play a short film for you directed by Jess Atkinson. Encourage you to watch it closely and listen closely. And then following that, we're going to take you through an after action report, if you will, frame by frame. And we encourage you again to ask questions as we go through it. So without further ado, let's roll the film. Founders Day, October 10th, 1845, is our official beginning. But the destiny of that date really goes back to an event that happened in 1842. And that was on board a brig named Summers. The U.S. brig Summers was out in the Atlantic under a commander, Alexander Slidell Mackenzie. Among the crew was a midshipman, Philip Spencer, and there were two senior enlisted people who started plotting with Spencer against the officers. It was a mutinous plan, and they got discovered. Mackenzie found all three guilty, and they were hung. They were hung from the yard arm, and it became known as the Summers Affair. This became the basis for saying, maybe we need to look more deeply at a more scholarly review as to how we create the future officers of the Navy, how we educated them, how we gave them the proper amount of leadership experience through apprenticeship. That formula was founded on October 10th in 1845. Good morning. My name is Major Lampert. I'm the Lima Company officer. 
Today, you are going to join the Brigade of Midshipmen this afternoon. You will formally swear an oath and join the 4th Class Regiment. You're not swearing an oath to a particular system of government. You are not swearing an oath to a particular individual. You are swearing an oath to an idea, an ideal of freedom of democracy. Class of 2020, rise. The founders got it right. What they established was a common baseline for all future generations of naval officers. It's the common experience over the course of the four years while a midshipman is here that establishes that foundation that they're going to draw upon over and over again throughout the rest of their careers and the rest of their lives. So help you God. People would love to imagine that on day one of a plebe's arrival here, they're ready to serve. They are not fully formed, perfect leaders of character. They have raw potential. But our task is to develop them. Welcome home, hotel. They're young entrance into their first year at the Naval Academy walk through is a symbolic transformation, preparing themselves for the transition that changes them from being a young high school graduate to a budding naval officer. The mission of the Naval Academy is to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically. What is the mission of the United States Naval Academy? Sir, the mission of the United States Naval Academy... Louder! Sir, the mission of the United States Naval Academy is to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically, and to do them... And do them. Everybody drop! The development part is probably the most essential part of the mission statement. What you're seeing is development. It's a harsh transition. Things that don't quite make sense at the time, but especially now, looking back, I realize that that had a very significant impact on my growth here as a person and as a midshipman. That transformation period is designed to be challenging, and it is. And we all have stories to tell about that. And that's our glue. That's the thing that binds us together. The institution is steeped in the military tradition, the military courtesies. We are, that, that's the kind of place this is. So that's the constant. But we do change because we've, I think probably the one thing we've learned over time is if you're not evolving with the time, you're going to become irrelevant. I think the Naval Academy has been able to change because of the leadership. The superintendents have been able to manage changes in our society. You either adjust or you become obsolete. And I think that is something that clearly is embedded in the DNA, if you will, of the Naval Academy. It is intrinsically tied to the story of America itself. So whether it be the movement to accept minorities, to the first admission of women, to the ability of homosexual uh, midshipmen to serve openly and proudly, these are things that the Naval Academy in its time and its due course has embraced to the uh, strength both of the institution and to America as well. So one of the great uh, things about the Naval Academy, I think, is the, the dual conversation that you can have about change and what remains constant. And the big constant, it's the human element that has given this place the sense of purpose. It keeps it fixed on the future, but it also gives us a guiding principle that we stay true to. is a palpable sense of purpose at this institution. Once you step foot on Strib and Walk here, you can feel the hum, the business end of this academy, and that is that every May, we are graduating about 950 or so new officers, second lieutenants and ensigns, and for some of them, within weeks or months, are gonna be on patrol overseas, protecting our national security interests. That is something that's very powerful in terms of keeping the energy, the motivation, the inspiration, the drive to constantly ask yourself, what have I done today to serve midshipmen? What have I, have I given them enough? 
there are two groups of friends of mine that I keep today closest in my heart. Those that I attended the Naval Academy with and those who I was in prison with, some of whom were fellow Naval Academy graduates. Those are the ones that I love most and know best. This place means a lot to its graduates. It gave us our beginning. It allowed us to fulfill our dreams. It allowed us to serve, to wear the uniform with pride. And we want to see it continue. The founders had a right. They had the right idea. gotten the mute off first um, that lends itself to my age so I'm still learning this stuff I got a first grade teacher upstairs that probably should be helping me anyway um, <laughs> we're just gonna jump right into the film uh, and, and make sure that we're gonna make the best film we can at the time we have every time um, you've got a certain amount of time until your deadline for for you all it'll be January 31st um, and you're just trying with whatever you have inside your head and you're trying to get it into a film, just try to do the best you can with that time that you have. Which one of the beautiful parts about this thing too is, is we're gonna pick three films so that we'll go over those as a workshop as well to try to see ways we can make those films better. Because you're about to see, you can always make a film better. Um, we start with this very simple principle. Um, and that is, in all of film, in all of life, you've got this big, long story, and you're really trying to narrow it down to the essential. What are those times, moments, things that um, have the biggest impact and, and, and help to really frame what a story is about? So for us, the way we do it, uh, is we try to reduce the story to one sentence. You try to communicate it in one sentence as to what your story is about. So this one, originally it was to create a three-minute film communicating the mission, values, and imagery of the United States Naval Academy. And we're going to tell that through the founding. Um, so what we started with was the film is about the mission and values of the United States Naval Academy. Um, you very early in a film, usually, it, it can depend, but really important moment is the inciting incident. Whenever you have a mutiny, that's a pretty good inciting incident. And, and so what we wanted to do, though, is set up that mutiny 
with the imagery of the Naval Academy. So that's where the Severn joins the tie, right there from the top of the chapel. Um, the cinematography part, it, it's not all that complicated. You'll see us go through it. A lot of times it's just wide, medium, and tight. And we're trying to get to this one thing, this one spot that we found. Again, we didn't know it was there. One of the things we'll do is we'll walk the, the place because my wife teaches uh, first graders to read. She always says the fet setting affects the story. Um, for us, it's the same kind of thing. To establish the setting becomes really important. Uh, and I, there are ways I could have done it in this film, I think, a lot better. So I'm walking around, and I see this one plaque and didn't know what it was. It's right there in Teak Court, but as it turns out, that spot is the exact spot where the Naval Academy was founded. So that gets us to the founding of it um, in 1845. Now, the why it was founded is that inciting incident and in some ways really gets us going. Once we establish that, then we're off and running. So the soup does that for us, right? And then we're on a boat. Um, and the imagery is, I, I really found it captivating. Uh, there was a lot there. Didn't know there were going to be things like the, the same flag that hangs in Memorial Hall. Um, but we're basically just setting up the mutiny with the historian, with some shots, with the ship. And it gets us to the main part, I think, that we could have improved this in, in number one to better establish the transition of that original ship. Because if I go back one, like that's the ship you're looking at. But if I go back even a little bit further to the first shot where you're on the, sh on the boat, like you're just on a boat and you have no idea why you're really there. What I thought I could have done better was to establish that and as you see, like the, the Brig Summers, we found the exact same one, same type, the Brig Ni uh, Niagara um, on Lake Erie, and we went up and shot it. And so I feel like if I'd have done a little bit better job, just a small little thing there, you would have felt like you were on that ship that was the mutiny. Um, so as, as we go through that part, the next place we're, we've got to get to is basically the mission, right, of, of what this is all about, the, the reason why the Academy uh, was founded. And it was with this question that the soup says, maybe we need to look more deeply at how we create the future officers of the Navy. Everything then kind of revolves around that. So you've got finally the founding of the Academy, the inciting incident, the founding in 1845. Uh, so then what we figured we'd do is we get to I Day because of the pomp and circumstance of it. This kind of leads us to improvement number two. Um, again, with transition. So you see Major Lampert there, you know, basically today is I Day. And the first real shot we see is what I think looking back on, it's just kind of a nondescript shot that I wondered, could I have set up the yard better? Um, could I have done it more justice? Because it's a dramatic day. Um, like I said, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance to it. And looking back on this, I kind of felt like we were just all of a sudden we were there, kind of the same way we're all of a sudden we're just on the ship. Um, so that actually gets us to number two. Um, once again, those, those transitions to place can be really important to help you, to put you there as a viewer. Um, I went back a little bit, and, and the, the photograph here, we'll go through the, these um, in a minute, but uh, the other interesting part was why they chose Annapolis. So um, they, they chose it because they wanted to get away from everything. Um, as it turns out, this is a shot from, I think it's 1850, and 
you see what it was like and you see the reason why they chose the place. Um, there was a, something called the Philadelphia Naval Asylum, which might not have been a bad name to keep, um, depending on how some people feel sometimes about the yard. Um, but they wanted to get away from Philadelphia at that point and put it in a place where, where they could really just focus and teach and learn. And so that was it in 1850. What if I would have gone from that, and you see in the bottom right-hand corner, you see the Tripoli Monument, and you see the cannons. You saw the cannons later in the film as well. Once again, it's one of those little connections that might be helpful to um, do uh, that just kind of form a sinew uh, to a film where you don't really notice it, but everything just kind of fits together. So if I'd have, if I'd have gone from there to the monument, if you look closely at the monument on the left, Summers is one of the names on that monument. Would have been perfect to be able to just create a little bit more connection. Um, after that, so we're at I Day, and we're going to build our, our way up to the oath, that really important moment, which you look at the, once again, if you're paying attention to the just the cinematography, a lot of it's just wide, medium, tight, right? It's just, as we, as we go through it, it, we had a couple of cameras, so it's easier for us, but we're always moving. One of the things that's gonna set up what we talk about next is, if you notice the Daunt there on his belt uh, in the back is a wireless transmitter. So we had him mic'd for that. Um, everybody knows you don't really need to mic any of the mid or the, the, the plebes for that. Um, their, their part in this is gonna be loud enough. But, but that gets us to the saying of the oath. And I don't know if you notice, but as we work through this lead up to the walk-in and, and this, this task then, what we need to do is get them in the door. Now, um, that gets us to the next thing that's more of a, it's kind of a principle, but it's also we wanted to pass along a bit of a tool here. And that is that audio really matters. Um, it's why I think with the daunt, when, when he was um, uh, prompting the oath, sounds like it's more intimate because we had a microphone on him. You just heard it through the, um, through the speakers. It, it wouldn't have felt the same, I don't think. And so when you're looking at doing your own film, it, people shoot with a lot of different things. A lot of you might be shooting with iPhones. It, they're great. They got great cameras. Wanted to kind of put something out there to be thinking about the audio in this way. That on your phones, you've got omnidirectional microphones, which means they treat all sound in front of you, behind you, to the sides equally the same. What you're really looking for is one of two things. One is a directional microphone, if you can use one, and they've got some things you can buy to put on an iPhone or other kind of DSLRs and that kind of thing. Not expensive, but they're directional. So what they do is they focus your, uh, they focus the audio, the microphone, on something that's in front of you. Um, they don't have to be expensive. The cheapest ones on B&H are like 59 bucks. But it's a great way to get the quality audio. What matters most with the audio is proximity. And so if you think about that, um, with the Daunt, I had the microphone basically a foot from his mouth, probably, right? Right in here, six, eight inches. If I go back one slide, the reason when she says, welcome hotel, the reason you can hear that is because I had a directional microphone and I got right up in her grill in order to listen to it. So I could make sure that I heard what she had to say. If I'd have been back further, there's no way I get that as crisp. I think it's good if you're going to um, be doing this with something that's got an omnidirectional, 
just make sure to try to remember that proximity is what matters most. And you see, I don't know if you can see it all that well, but the one guy with a boom microphone there and they're, as they're shooting the scene, it's got to, those, those things got to be within three feet because the great audio people will tell you, you really got to get close. So if you're going to use omnidirectional, get as close as you can, try to make sure that if it's an interview, it's a quiet room, a, a great um, resource for you might be this, uh, and just, just Google it. Uh, there was a doc done making waves. It's tremendous. It's like a full length and, and so, like there, there's two kind of, in, in some ways, lost people who, who work in the film business. I think a lot of times um, they, they lament the lost craft of two things. Um, one is, is the writing. And you heard people, if you've, if you've jumped onto some of the other discussions, um, how writing is so important um, to films. And the other is audio. And that's basically just been a, a function of the business model of people with being one man bands and running around doing it all themselves, that those, those audio professionals uh, do amazing work. So making waves, it'd be a great um, resource for you. Um, Jesse, now, not a bad time, I would say, to pause for some questions if you got any, Joe, that, or, or anything. Well, I, I want to jump in. Yeah, you, you bring up a great point. I mean, first of all, the, the, the documentary is it's not only informative, but it's, it's entertaining. And, you know, for those of you who are thinking about making your first film, it's really helpful because you want to develop the mindset that audio can help tell the story. And, you know, it just says audio matters. A couple of great quotes from the film, by the way. Steven Spielberg said, I've always been a believer that ears lead our eyes to where the story lives. And that can give you a mindset. And the other thing I'll share is this, and it's something that I had to do um, as an exercise when I was in college in a radio class. I had to create a sound story. So basically think about how would you tell a story with just sounds, audio, natural sound, music. Think about that. Uh, just a couple of quick takeaways based on, you know, this documentary and, and Jess's points. Next, we'll work our way up to um, the door slam because that's always a, um, a dramatic moment. Um, there's one other thing that I probably should mention uh, about this sequence from, let's say, when everybody's walking in to the moment when the door slams. Uh, this is something to keep in mind. One of the, the reasons why we really like to, to do this is because um, we, we get a really good glimpse of some of the things that work when you're trying to make a film and some of the things that don't. And we're, we've always been, and it's my, been my background because we used to we used to, you know, you got, you all call them after actions. We used to call them film sessions. You'd play on Sunday, and then Monday you'd you'd basically watch the film or the game, and they'd be just brutal. Um, but film never lied, so it was the only way to improve. And so I wanted to run you through one sequence that you never saw, because, and it's the reason why we do what we do, is because we've made every mistake in the book, and so back to that first, um, that first slide. We're just trying to make the best film we can with the time that we have. And so what, one of the things you didn't see is when all the plebes are coming in and we'd gotten special permission to be inside because at, at that point, nobody had ever shot this from the inside. They'd only shot it from the outside. So everybody's walking in and this is, well, this is where I was. And I knew that I wanted to get the doors closing from the inside. So uh, you've been shooting it for a while. I, I got all those other shots. Um, I'm moving around. You can see I was by the door at one point. Now I'm back. So I know that pretty much this is where I'm going to be at the end. So I pan over and I follow this group as they're coming through. And all of a sudden, I realize like 
uh oh, they're the last ones. And so I whip it back. You can see right there, I'm not in focus. Um, the doors are starting to close and I'm still not in focus, but wait, it gets worse. Um, I'm finally in focus when they close the doors, but I had actually accidentally hit stop. And so I quickly had to hit um, record again. So the doors are now closed. And by the time I get myself together, you've got this great moment where one of the detailers has her hands in the air, the doors are closed. And then something I hadn't taken into account, um, man, it is dark. Uh, it is probably too dark to use. Um, so, so even though I knew what I was after, um, I, and I planned on it, I didn't get it, which gets us to this next, maybe it's an insight. Maybe you've heard people talk about different parts to this. Um, and that is what's in a film is just what's in a film. It, it doesn't have the, the first word, last word on truth. It's one person's perspective, the filmmaker's perspective. But ultimately what goes in a film is what you shoot and edit in there. And I think that's probably something important to remember um, because you'll you'll have some things that just don't work out. And then once again, you've got that deadline, that constraint of time, which is another reason why you're just trying to move all, you're just trying to do the best film you can. Um, which brings us to the editing part of it, some tools. Um, we edit with DaVinci Resolve. Uh, it's free. You can download it. Uh, it used to be just a coloring, um, basically, app, kind of a high-end thing. And now they offer a $300 thing for studio, for professionals, but you can download it for free. It is fantastic. Uh, one thing to, um, and Joe, why don't you cover the part of how much time it takes? Because you can do it quick, down, and dirty, if you, like Joe's done in television, or to really do it well, it takes a lot of time. Yeah, it does take a lot of time because, you know, now day and age, what this lends itself to when you sit down, let's say you sit down to a laptop with DaVinci Resolve and you're going to edit. Well, chances are you, you're the person who uh, shot the film. So you're the cinematographer. You are the producer because you're putting it all together and you are the editor. So you're thinking with three brains there, really. And... You, you just don't rush through it. So bottom line is for a two minute film and you want to make it good, think about needing to work 20 hours on it. It would take that much amount of time to be able to, to go through all the material, think about how to put it together and then make it sing as you go through the editing process. One thing that might drive home that point is that that famous story about um, star Wars uh, that um, actually, it was a guy, Paul Hirsch, that kind of saved it because it was this um, thing that was in what's-his-name's head and and just kind of one of those crazy things that so George Lucas had done it all. He would put it together two weeks before he think he was going to show it, takes it to Paul Hirsch, and it's just a disaster. Like, it's just a total mess. Um, Hirsch, an editor, takes it rearranges it, works with what he's got, and which is what we all do, and kind of the rest is history. Um, but that last step is in many ways one of the most important parts to creating the film because ultimately the film is the medium, right? And all it is is what's in it. Um, I did see a question there, um, uh, Joe. I don't, I don't know that I see it anymore, but um, uh, it, it was basically about um, some editing tools. Da, da Vinci works on just about any Mac or anything like that, um, so you're, you're pretty much good to go there. 
Um, all right, so moving along with the film, the, the, the things, so far the improvements just with transitions have, have been more technical. Maybe they've made a little bit of difference. This next one, though, I think is, is going to maybe be a little bit more important as, as far as that goes, because where we're going next is the mission statement. It's big and long, right? Um, and, and so, but I focused on develop. And you heard, you know, the that the mission is is to develop, and and Dean Phillips, I, I thought, put it perfectly. And then you you see that development, right? Um, and then this goes to so part of that plaque, part about something that you hear all over the yard, is to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically, and really important to to listen, uh, because it's, I think it's something that I missed. We're, we're watching it, right? We're watching it, but, you know, uh, Wendy Lawrence says it's the glue, and it that mental, moral, and physical gets us to where Dean Phillips talked about the mil military tradition, but we do change. So let's take stock for just a second, where we are in the arc of this thing. So um, there's a mutiny, there's a founding, and then we're to the development today of midshipmen. We're going to go to tradition and change and then the alma mater, right? And so there's no moral, mental, and physical. I hear that all the time, but I didn't put that anywhere in it. And, and I thought to myself kind of after I watched all this this thing that that not only should it have had a place, but boy, it would have helped me continue on my way to my ultimate goal. And that when you lose your way in films, a lot of times it's kind of at this point. And that's why I will go back to the importance of that one sentence, right? Which is if you've got that guidepost of where you're going, it's more difficult to lose your way. So what if I would have included the moral, mental, and physical? Well, the moral would have been such a great way to illustrate the change that has taken place with race and gender and a myriad of other changes at the, at the, at the academy um, that uh, Brigitte articulated so well. Like that moral component would have led us to the change. And that tension between tradition and change has been there at the academy through, throughout all of this and always will be. It's, it's actually one of the great tensions in, in life, right? And so that would have helped. Um, the mental, I'm, I'm not so sure I had enough time to delve too much into that. The physical easily would have helped me with that transition to boxing. Um, and that this is something else that, that you know, you, you talk about the, the tradition versus the change. And once again, was left out. We'll get to it in a little bit. But when the academy was first founded, there was basically a four to three split between military and civilian instructors. It's stayed about that breakdown. And is not only unique to the academy, but gives it some of its greatest strengths, right? Some of its greatest tensions, but some of its greatest strengths as well. And so I thought that was another way that I would have been able to improve this. Um, because ultimately, when I talked about that boxing scene, um, the, I'll go to these two frames, um, the tradition and change can be seen in two frames, right? I'll go back to the other. Uh, those old pictures of folks, but from, from the statue to today is a great way to illustrate that change. How much better would those, those two shots have been and impactful would they have been if I'd have set up the other parts to it? Um, and then I thought that the 
that Dant summed it up really nicely. Um, that, that that is one of the great things is that about the academy is the, is that conversation it's an ongoing conversation and so i alluded to it a little bit before kind of missed it everything's kind of right in front of you if you listen you know how many times did i hear moral mental physical and didn't include it in the film um but you know you you've got the the soup with the dean um the ad like like that shot right there encapsulates that military civilian faculty makeup. Um, and one of the strengths that, that could have been more easily um, uh, set up and executed. Then I kind of wanted to go to, to something else with this that, that I thought was important on is Major Lampert. Um, because what I loved about what he said was, have I done enough? And, and I thought that that is something that um, probably everyone who serves MIDS asks themselves. And it's, it's one of, again, to me, in getting to know the place and the people at the academy is, is one of the, the, the secrets to, to the success. Um, and, and so, so that's something, have I done enough? Have I lived up to the ideals that were set forth in the founding? That, that'll get us to the end of this in a minute. But um, so we kind of go through graduation um, to which sometimes I, you just like a shot. I was, again, I was allowed to be um, kind of in the middle of all this and knew the shot that I wanted and got it. Uh, with a wide angle lens. So um, uh, that pre-production and knowing where you want to be for an event can always put you uh, in a good spot. Um, and then sometimes it's just the emotion of what you're seeing in front of you. And I could have turned my camera in any direction and gotten the love that I saw and respect that I saw. Um, and I, you, know, you can't move because the families are in on you like in a, in a split second, uh, right? Um, uh, hey, Jeff, you, you, brought ahead, Jeff. A couple, you, you brought a couple, couple of quick points that were just really profound. I just wanted to make sure we highlighted them. But you were talking about um, being um, in, in a couple of these places in the right moment. Um, and I didn't want to underestimate it because these are two of the most powerful shots in the piece. Um, the shot of the hats flying that you got with the wide angle lens and then being there for this moment where you can't move around. And it, it didn't happen by chance. Um, like you said, it happened because you, you, you planned it pre-production. Um, you, you did your homework on where you thought you needed to be during this event to capture that one moment when it happened, because you only got one shot. So if you want to get those moments, plan ahead try to anticipate what's going to happen. And, and that's what you did to get this stuff. And I just, um, I don't, I don't take it for granted for sure as a producer on the piece here with you. Thanks, Joe. I, uh, so we, we get to Wendy Lawrence and we're going to set up the, um, the alma mater. And it's interesting because um, the Don said the founders had it right. Wendy Lawrence said the founders had it right. Um, and, and then we're going to, we're going to get to the alma mater and in, in the beauty of Memorial Hall, we set this up. We, that was something that, that they kind of wanted in the film. So how was I going to put it in there? And this was kind of got us to the, to the next thing. And a bunch of this stuff kind of comes together. Um, so we already know though, that the founders had it right. And so where does, and how does the alma mater embody that? And one of the questions that we always ask ourselves, like for, for when we're, we've got a filmmaker who says, hey, I got a great idea for a film. Always ask who cares? Like, who cares? Like, yeah, I got a great idea of a film. It's about the founding of the Academy. Who cares? Oh, well, there was this mutiny and, and the Naval Academy is this great place. And, and, and they, they did it in response to a mutiny. They, they founded it because they needed to find a better way. Yeah, who cares? Um, 
if you keep asking that question, you can keep giving yourself answers. Uh, it helps you make a better film and, and, and a, a more broad and deeply held film. Uh, and for this reason, uh, i use this as an example. Like, if you ever been into Memorial Hall, be like, man, that place is beautiful. You put the Glee Club in there, it's like, wow. You hear it, it's amazing. Um, a lot of people are like, who cares? So I felt like I could have done a better job of setting up what the alma mater means to a graduate. I, I followed the words to it, right? And you see me kind of going through it. And I get there when two or three shall meet. I got two, then I got three, then I got old stories be retold. Um, uh, Staubach and, and Keenan, nothing could, nothing could uh, probably encapsulate that better uh, or represent that better. But, but as far as conveying the meaning, I probably could have, and I'll get you back to improvement number six, could have better set up like what and why it means what it means to you all. Uh, because it is the end and, and you feel it. But if you didn't know anything about the academy and I set it up a little bit better, you probably feel it a little bit more. Um, especially when you consider that um, the last shot is, is to pledge the blue and gold. Um, so what, what does the blue and gold mean? And, and I'll just give you one example that I'm still thinking about. I just thought about it probably 30 minutes before we jumped on. Um, the emblem, the insignia, that is all over the yard. I, I wonder if I could have brought a little more meaning to that and then ended it with that emblem on the flag. And so we'll get to this last slide before the Q and A, um, which is where we started trying to reduce that story to the essential in one sentence. It, it seems to me that if I'd had done a better job, the film would have been about living up to our ideals. We all got them personally, teams, institutions. It, if I could have driven home that a little bit more in those ways that we talked about, probably would have been a better film. And I guess I'll always get it back to what I've come to and the reason we do these things. You can always improve. And that's one of the, the fun parts of being a, a filmmaker is, is I know very few film, filmmakers, like being a filmmaker, it's like when somebody asks you, you know, they usually they'll ask you, hey, you, you done anything I've seen? Um, I don't know many filmmakers that just made one film. Most of them, it's plural. So there are a lot of them because it's in you, you want to do it, and you just keep trying to, to improve your craft. So I'll stop there with that. Joe, I don't know how you're working on the questions or. Um, yeah, you know, we got four cards for that. Yeah, before I jump into Q and A, I just wanted to hammer home this point here that because you you know you, you showed how that one sentence changed, and uh, I wanted to just point out you know just how important that sentence is because that sentence is is your best friend when you're making a film. You might say like, "What?" The reason why I say that is that film that one sentence is your guiding principle that you use to measure everything. Um, that you do to make sure that the film is is heading in the right direction and it progresses the way it should. So this sentence changed um, because we, we realized different things as the film went along. But had the had we started out with this sentence, we probably uh, wouldn't uh, have made some of the mistakes that we did. <laughs> it just goes to show you how important it is. Uh, to, to have that one sentence and, and really dis distilling your thoughts down to one sentence is um, it, it takes a little bit of work, right, Jess? It does. It does. <laughs> so we do, um, 
we, we do now want to move to sort of the the, uh, the the question and answer session. Like I mentioned earlier at the top, there's a little tab on the bottom of your screen where you can hit that, and then you can type in any question you have um, for Jess or or myself. And really, this is a great time to ask questions about the film that you're thinking of making. Um, we do want to encourage you to enter the filmmaking contest. We'll get you some details on that, but uh, we'll jump right into the questions right now. And, and one of the questions we have is, you know, do you write, and, and they are coming fast and furious now. So um, <laughs> the first question I'll get to is, do you write your own scripts or do you hire somebody on the outside? So Jess, maybe address a little bit about scripting, because first of all, what we're showing here is really unscripted um, filmmaking. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier about how hard that is to do. That what we just showed you was strict, straight, um, documentary, nonfiction uh, film. Fiction films, uh, completely different. I, I, I only read nonfiction. I, I know I should. I would be a much better person if I read fiction. It's it's not something that I, um, I I have to. It's not something that I'm very comfortable with. And and so to your question about about writing the script in a documentary nonfiction, you don't have to worry about authenticity because basically what you're seeing is is usually pretty authentic. When you're creating something from nothing, that's a much different level. Um, and so um, with the writing, I think in some ways, uh, you take a look at the mediums. Um, a, a lot of films are just adaptations of books. And, and so what does a script do? It takes a book and reduces it to a two-hour movie. And so the dialogue has to represent um, the, the book in a sense, right? The story of the book, which is a really, we just showed you how hard it is to do with one sentence. Definitely hard to do when you've got more than one sentence. Um, let me just jump into one thing, Joe, if I could, because I saw it and it, it disappeared. Mm -hmm. um, if I use a cell phone, is it a film? Anything Great that's moving in movies, um, we consider a film. This is just how we do it. it if you wanted to show uh, 10 different memes uh, for two minutes and call it a film, it's a film. Anything that tells a story to me in the medium of moving images uh, deserves to be called a film. And, and, and one of the great democratizing things of the digital age uh, is that you can use a cell phone um, to, to make a film that you have in your head or in your heart. Um, it, it doesn't need to play in a movie theater. Yeah, Jess, um, I get passionate about that, that question about cell phones because, um, you know, if you take a cell phone and you turn it like this landscape, you shoot actual HD video, but these cell phones are so p powerful in terms of taking images, it shoots 4K that, and now you can buy very inexpensive tools uh, to help you zoom in and out or to get that wide angle shot that you actually got of the hats. You can do that with a cell phone. Um, you know, audio, you can even connect a microphone uh, through a cell phone that goes into um, the, the, the port on the phone. So you, you can actually make a really good looking film um, that could play on television and look and look fine um, from, from a cell phone. Right. Yeah, Joe, Joe, let me just jump in for one thing too, because we talked a little bit about this a, a while back. We operate in a 16 by nine um, rectangle uh, horizontally. So that's how we do it. One of the things that we love to see from young filmmakers is, is it, we would ask somebody if they're going to shoot something for us to shoot it in horizontal. It doesn't really matter. Once again, a film, all that it needs to be is what's in your head or in your heart. It gets to be whatever you want it to be. 
So we got, uh, we got some good questions here. I like this one because way back in the day, um, when I was a sports producer, I actually interviewed Jess when he played professional football. And someone asked, are there similarities between playing professional football and filmmaking? Jess? Yeah, interesting question. Let me think about that for a second. Um, yeah, so let me start with this and work my way through if I could. Um, one similarity uh, would be for if you're a kicker, um, you only get like five, ten plays a game. Um, so you're standing around a lot and watching. Um, when you're at practice, uh, you don't do that much. Everybody else is running around hitting each other. You don't do that much, so you observe. Uh, to me, that observation of something um, is, is something that has served me well in filmmaking. I'll go back to this spot um, to be able to see that, um, to find that, um, to be able to look up and see the flag, um, uh, to notice. I knew I wanted to, uh, in this, I knew I needed some rope somewhere, somehow. I needed to do, you know, if you're hung from the yard arm, I got the yard arm, right? Um, but the rope part, um, that, so that, that to me just at least was a way to represent that. And, and again, to, I'll, I'll go back to this part with the, with an iPhone, you see how close I am to that, uh, to the rope. Um, you can, if you want to accentuate something, um, get close to it, put it in the foreground. It's a great way to, especially if you don't have the range of a zoom, it's a great way to have people focus on what you want to focus on. That's number one. Um, number two, as I'll just speak to a kicker, um, maybe as an athlete, um, you're, you get used to trying and failing and that it's not the end of the story. If you keep trying, the most important thing is that if you really want to do something that you keep trying at it and you, that's how you learn. So that the second part to athlete kicker filmmaker is, um, and, and let's like, this was 2017. I want to say, I'll say three years ago, right? I've been shooting and cutting films for 15 years, 14 years still making mistakes, still do make mistakes. It's okay. Just keep at it. Those would be the two main things. Jess, before we get to uh, another couple of questions. Joe, 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 Joe one, one last thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. There, there's maybe one last thing to it too. Um, uh, and that is that uh, I'll go to, to sports with highlights in ESPN. When you look at the story of a game now, right? Um, and, and just about any highlight package that's ever been cut tells the story of the game and it's the highlights. Um, those aren't, if you played the game, those aren't necessarily the most important plays in a game. There could be, there could be a play that isn't all that, you know, it doesn't look all that great. It's not a scoring play, whatever it is. It could be a tackle on third down where the guy stops him a, a yard short of the, of the first down marker and they got a punt, you know, in the fourth quarter. That could have been a really important play. You never see that. So, so one of the things that I try to do is to try to look within, let's just use the game as the example, because there used to be something called the wide world of sports. It was the human drama of athletic competition. It's what we love about sports, right? Is it's human drama right in front of us in like a three hour window. Life has the same kind of drama. You just got to look for it. So sorry, I've got a little wordy on that. So. 
Oh, no, no, that's that's good. That, that, that's that's good stuff. And, and we've got a few more questions we'll get to, but I wanted to bring out, a, go back to that first point you made, because it's a really important takeaway for anybody who wants to make a film. You said your time as a kicker gave you a chance to be observant, and you've always brought up that point that as a cinematographer, uh, that's one of your strengths. And I've heard of even great still photographers, they'll say the same thing. And when you were pointing out all those, the multitude of shots of the ship, um, in our film, the sequence on that brig is 39 seconds long. And Jess used 15 shots to tell that story there. 15 shots, um, which means there were a lot of shots that he didn't use. But the point is, he was observant enough to get enough shots that were needed to tell that story. And just to give you the grand perspective of the whole film, which is, it's eight and a half minutes long, there's 139 shots in this film. It comes out to like 3.7 seconds per shot. So you need to be observant um, wherever you are uh, to not only get the 139 shots we used, but you know maybe the, the, the 400 shots total that you're going to pick the 139 good ones uh, to make the film. So it, it was a real important takeaway that you brought up, Jess. A um, couple of other questions we had. Um, first, what's the most rewarding aspects of filmmaking that for you? Uh I'll, if you want to go first, you can go. I, I know what mine is. No, go go far um, away. Um, for me, there's that old adage that everybody's got a story. And uh, for most of my adult life, the uh, channels of distribution were closed to someone to be able to tell their story on film in moving images. And I, I desperately believe that just about everybody has a, has a story that deserves to be told to their kids, to their parents, to their families, to their friends, to greater society at large. Um, and so what I love about telling stories is sharing the stories of people who I think deserve to have their story told. And now I get to do it because I don't have to get it on TV or put it in a movie theater. I can do it. You can do it. And you can just put it up on the web. That's pretty awesome. Um, for me, it's, it's real simple. Um, it's being able to um, get somebody else comfortable enough, you know, to share uh, their own story and get them into a place where, you know, it, it's about them. Um, I was never um, a TV star. I, I didn't do much on camera. I was a guy, I've always been a guy behind the scenes. And so I've always felt more comfortable making someone else the star. And when I've had people share with me after we get done with an interview, um, wow, I've never said that before. That's the biggest compliment you can get because they felt comfortable enough to share something. And, you know, being a competitive person, you, you want to get something that somebody else has never done before. So, you know, for me, that's that, that's the most rewarding. Um, but um, and, and I do share that because, you know, I want someone else to be able to experience what it's like to be able to get somebody into that place where they're comfortable to share something with you. Um, we've got. Um, a few other questions that you know have, have come in and this is interesting you know your favorite genre to create watch joy and work on and jess you kind of touched upon this a little bit with not really going into the non-fiction area but if you want to take that uh we're not going going into the fiction area yeah favorite favorite to do um i, I do think it's just straight documentary uh, usually having to do with people, uh, uh, 
that, that's usually what it is to be able to develop the characters uh, as much as you can. Um, and for me, that's just because I, I find that I, I gravitate toward real things. Um, uh, although I, I get it, right, that, that nonfiction and metaphor and all these things are, are really, really powerful um, and, and can be to the imagination. If, if, I, if I connect it to, um, to the, the film festival that if you want to you know, make your own film, um, we're going to take all comers, right? It, it could be fiction, nonfiction, comedy. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. We, we appreciate them all the same. Um, but I think, I think that's, that's why you see, and especially in this day and age, um, I think in some ways it's kind of the, the golden age. A lot of people talk about um, not so much with uh, uh, the, the big Hollywood stuff, because that what's going on in Hollywood, I don't know if you tuned in earlier, which is, can be largely a function of economics now and the impacts that, impact that digital technology has had uh, on the film industry um, and will continue to have. Um, but I, I mean, you just, you need to look for no further than Netflix. You can find kind of whatever you want, whatever floats your boat in pretty high quality a, a, or even YouTube for goodness sake. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah. And you brought up the point and we'll emphasize it again that, you know, the, the whole point of this is to, is to inspire you to create your own film uh, tell the story you want to tell while, while Jess and I lean towards the documentaries because that's what moves us. Um, comedy might move you and comedy is really hard um, to sure. pull off. There's, and that's why we won't touch it. I actually think that's the hardest thing to do because in any other genre, um, you're either telling a story uh, that um, you just is in your heart to tell. You're trying to connect with an audience that will pay money to come see your film or just watch it, right? But comedy has to elicit a laugh. And that's one of the reasons why I think there are so few comedians is because, man, that is a hard thing to do. It is hard. And in fact, you know, any like instruction in one on one in, in delivering speeches is don't try to start off with a joke because more times than not, you're going to fail. So don't bother. Um, but when it comes to creating films, that's where I, I'm in the most awe of, of people who do create comedy because the people who are good at it are really good at it, like really good. And it's it's complex. Uh, so we do encourage um, you folks out there who are inspired by comedy um, to to go for it. And we do hope, I mean, Jess and I hope we get to, you know, judge a few of them in this contest that we're talking about that we'll give you some more details on uh, later on. Um, I did want to share just before I get to another question, there was just a comment um, and it, it's what makes all of this humbling for Jess and I and comes in from, Richard Severing House. Um, he said he was commissioning um, CEO of USS Annapolis uh, in 1992, building the boat at Electric Boat. He said he was amazed and pleased at the support of the entire community, state, local, military, and civilian in honoring their crew and mission to commission a new uh, fast attack. He said it was a humbling and terrific experience, and watching this film evoked all those uh, great memories. And um, you know, he's realized uh, well, a lot has changed, a lot has stayed the same at the yard since he graduated back in 1973. And I, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to share that w with everyone um, because uh, you know it's humbling for us just to be able to get um, that kind of response, and, and we do appreciate it. Um, but along the lines of you know, questions, another one came in is, what is your favorite military movie? You know, considering that we do documentaries, is, is there a, f a nonfiction or, or a fiction film, Jess, that stands out for you? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> Apocalypse Now. <laughs> 
um, that that probably is the fiction one. Um, I I I thought it was a really interesting discussion earlier about whether um, some of these films are propaganda or not. And I always feel like that's in the eye of the beholder um, and a really tough thing to, to tease out. Um, uh, but as far as a fiction one goes, I, I'd probably have to say that Apocalypse Now still is my, is my favorite because because in a way, it, 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 I mean, it, it, once again, it was hard darkness. It wasn't as a metaphor for, for something else. Um, uh, not necessarily a Vietnam War uh, film. What about you, Joe? Well, it's actually a film that was brought up during one of the other sessions here in the conference, and uh, platoon, um, and uh, it just brought the whole um, idea of combat that was based on Vietnam um, to life for me. You know, I grew up uh, in the late 60s, early 70s with the Vietnam War. I remember vividly when my uncle was there and couldn't come home for Christmas. And uh, it brought it all really, really uh, close to home. And, uh, you know, the folks who, who mentioned it in the conference said it actually, you know, created some awareness. And uh, so that's that's why that one, um, you know, has stood out. It stood out for me. Um, I'll, I'll, give encourage you, you, we, we, yeah, go ahead. I'll give you two for, for nonfiction. One is Helen back again. Uh, and the other is Restrepo. Uh, that that there was real power in just communicating um, what it was like as opposed to really putting it in any big broad context as metaphor. I thought those thought both those two films were 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 just phenomenal in being able to just show you some things to consider that you might not have considered before. So that's a good point. Um, we do have a little bit more time for Q&A, so I'll encourage you. The, there's the Q&A tabs at the bottom of the screen, but um, there's a, a couple of things I wanted to bring up that we um, wanted to touch upon earlier. You know, Jess, we had shown what was the original ship um, at, at, the, at the beginning of this film, or said that he should have shown that, and then he found this brig um, um, in in New York at Niagara. And um, that was, you know, a great idea. And you, we encourage, you know, we encourage you always think about what's the, what's your dream in making a film, the best thing you can do to, to, to go get something. And for this, for Jess, it was, we had to find the, uh, something like the original ship. Well, then the challenge became, well, if we're going to shoot on that ship, we need insurance to be able to do so. And so we had with basically a day to get an insurance certificate that allowed us access to the ship. So we want to alert you to certain things that come up for you to be able to get your so-called dream shots. Don't let it discourage you from dreaming of those great shots you need to get, but just be aware that there are some hurdles you have to jump through sometimes to get the shots that you want to get. Um, so we, we do have a, uh, another question. Um, so fire away. Um, so much in media and film is subtle. What is the line in possibly delivering hard hitting content? Does subtlety have a longer lasting impact? So it's a, a loaded question. Um, does subtlety because. have a longer lasting impact? Um, boy, it's a, I, I guess I might answer that this way. Um, it, to me, it seems like the great films are the ones that you watch again and again and pick up things that you'd missed before 
part of what makes them great. There's so much packed into it that you hadn't realized, hadn't seen, hadn't thought about. And that might be speaking to exactly your point that it, it, those subtleties matter. And I, I'll give you one thing that um, I'd heard uh, in an earlier ones, a reference to the book Story by Robert McKee. It's kind of the Bible for screenwriters. We used it to try to understand story and apply it to, to nonfiction documentaries. Um, but like we all got that little voice in our head when we're watching something, we're thinking, is that real? Is that not real? Um, do I like that? Do I not? Is, is, you know, kind of a thumbs up or thumbs down kind of part to it. And that um, with subtlety, it, there's so much that goes into a film. And McKee, one of the things that he'll talk about is to never have a, a scene in a film that doesn't change the value trajectory of the film or just get rid of it. Why do you have it? But that when you're watching something, that's why the great, I don't know about you all, Joe, but my wife and I, we'd go talk about, or we'd go to a film, we'd be talking about it when we're walking out of there because this is what I saw. This is what I felt. This is what I think. And I think to your question, I think a lot of the magic happens in subtlety which there's a lot more in a scene and in a film than meets the eye. Although, you know, Joe talked about audio, although that's primarily how we're digesting it, right? It's a visual art form. Yeah. I, when you talk about subtlety, um, I think that's where, that's, that's a big part of where audio comes in. You know, Steven Spielberg had that quote said, you know, our ears lead our eyes to the story when you're watching a film, you don't even realize that until you think about it later on. So, you know, when you are creating your own film, think about those sounds um, that can help. Um, or maybe, you know, the music swells at a certain point to help evoke uh, emotion um, in, a, in a subtle way. So... Um, you know, th this this brings up a good point, and th the other thing um, it leads to that I want I, I thought we Jess and I wanted to touch so can upon. I, so can go I ahead. jump in right before you do that? Yeah. Uh, just one, yeah, one thing ahead. we always encourage our, our especially young filmmakers to do is to uh, sometimes turn off the sound when you're watching a film or you're watching a series, and just if if you've never shot before. Um, if it seems daunting to you, just watch how it's put together. You just watch the shots. There aren't that many options uh, as far as composition goes, wide, medium, tight, real close, that kind of thing. But you see, if you watch it without the audio, it will give you just a different way to view a film that you're, that you're taking in without even realizing it. Sorry, Joe. Go ahead. No, that's that's a great point. And, um, you know, one of the things I just do want to be remiss because we talked about editing early on. And, you know, for example, if you have a two minute film and you need 20 hours to to edit it, one of the reasons why it takes 20 hours is because the the art, the act of of physically editing something is you're boiling something down to um, what's essential and it you need to think about what you what you need to just be able to communicate the goals of that one sentence that governs your whole story and it takes a lot of discipline to eliminate all the stuff you don't need that you need to get to what's only essential um so we have time um a couple more questions so um Here's one. Say you've written a massive historical narrative that follows one character through some epic history that many do not know about. How do you choose what to go in a script? And I and I, I guess that that's all part of what's you know the storytelling part of, of of essential. So I'll take the first crack at it. Um, you have a massive, long story, epic history that people do not know about. 
it's really thinking about what do they need to know to be able to follow the story and what makes it most impactful. I mean, that, that's how I'll start it off, Jess. Joe, did they say, suppose you've written a massive historical narrative? Was that the question? Yes, that's correct. My first response would be, if you're a mid and you've written a massive historical narrative, you probably need to be studying a heck of a lot more. Um, <laughs> right. Or you might not make it to graduation. Um, second is, uh, so, yeah, so massive historical narrative, boiling it down to the essential. Um, what matters? What matters to the to the story that you're trying to tell? And and it's a really high bar. What what can you do without is, is another way to ask that question. Does it advance the story? Um, and and the last part I'd say is is that um, a massive historical narrative might be a little much to bite off if you're just trying to do a or something in a film uh, festival with a time limit of five minutes. Um, but never say never. I guess it could be done. Uh, that would be my best answer. So we, we got a couple of minutes uh, to uh, take some more questions before we have to wrap things up. But I want to get back to like a question that came in earlier because this really just struck me. And someone had asked, you know, uh, do you have uh, – what comparisons can you draw from being a, a player in the National Football League and a filmmaker? And one of the things that was brought to my attention by another uh, former athlete is that athletes are so used to being coached and and having that brutal after action session of watching film and that brutal after action report of taking constructive criticism and having thick skin that that helps you immensely. Uh, in filmmaking. And Jess, if you could talk to just the constructive criticism process, because we actually did that here. You openly criticized a film you had made three years ago. Yeah. Um, it's the only way you get better. It's the only way you get better. And if you're, if you're trying to do something that's hard and you know that you, you're going to have to improve in order to either make it or stay there, uh, then it becomes a little bit easier because you don't look to the end um, and, and the end result, you're just looking at what's in front of you every day, trying to, to get better. And so for a film, whatever you start with, it's the beauty of nonlinear linear editing as well, is that you can put stuff in, move them around, um, make sense of it. You, you just try and, to put more thought, more effort, more heart into whatever it is that you're making, whatever story you're trying to tell, and it'll get better as you, This is, I guess this would be something else, show it to more people and have that conversation. Because what happens is, is that if, take me as an example, I make a, a, a film and I've got a draft of it, I show it to Joe. He, at the very least, if I don't make changes, like let's say he says, hey, you need a better transition here. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I don't think so. What it does is it forces you to defend your intent and your position on it. If you can make a good case for that, then maybe you keep it as your own but or keep it the way it is. But by and large, what happens is, is that if you can't, make a good case of why to keep something the way it is, you're open to changing it, making it better. That's how you improve. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And um, the one final thing I'll share regarding, you know, that constructive criticism process, if you're in a position where you don't have the opportunity to show it to other people, you're, you're on a deadline, it's, and you have the time, sleep on it. I can't tell you how many times I've worked on something. Um, I was at the point of exhaustion and I got up the next day. I was like, Oh my God, what was I thinking? I mean, I, I need to, I need to change that. So sometimes uh, come back and, and take it, take another look the, the next day. So 
that really uh, wraps things up uh, for us here on, on the questions. We had some great ones. We really appreciate it. Um, so our time is together is coming to an end, and uh, we want to first now show you a short video that we've been talking about this filmmaking contest and film festival, and now we can finally uh, give you some more information about it. So please, roll the video. Calling all filmmakers or wannabe filmmakers. Are you inspired by what you just saw? Ready to make a film on your own? Or just looking for a way to win cash prizes? The Naval Institute and the Stockdale Center at the Naval Academy challenge you to submit a short documentary film. My name is Midshipman Second Class Benoit Gorgements, and I'm here to tell you about an exciting opportunity. Cameras, smartphones, computers, and other technology have made it easier for anyone to become a filmmaker. Storytelling allows us to capture history, inspire action, or change. Capture the story you want to tell by entering our filmmaking contest. Films can be any genre, scripted or non-scripted, drama or comedy, mystery or romance. The opportunity is yours. However, the film must have a tie to the U.S. military. A loose tie is okay, and it can be long, no longer than five minutes. Oh yeah, and by the way, this is a challenge for amateur filmmakers. Sorry, Spielberg. Grab your iPhone and get started today. A few other important details. Films must be submitted by January 31st, 2021. Details on how to submit your film can be found on usni.org under the events section. A pop-up will also appear at the end of this webinar and will take you to the webpage for more details. Only a limited number of entries will be accepted, so get moving today. Cash prizes will be awarded to the top entries. And the top entries will also have an opportunity to work with the filmmakers at Three Penny Films for an after-action critique. And finally, all entries will be featured in our virtual film festival next spring. Lights, camera, action. Get started today. All right, Joe, I'll jump to final thought. Yes, sir. Look really four things. As you saw, the sentence you start with doesn't have to be the one you end up with. That's one of the beauties of filmmaking. It can change as you go. Um, when doing interviews, because they are, they can be so important uh, to the narrative in, in documentary film, listen to the room before you start recording anything. That way you can, you can there'll be an omnidirectional microphone probably. That way you'll be able to hear if there will be background noise that interrupts with the, the narrative in the interview. That'll hurt you if it does. So listen to the room. If, you've, if it's your first time, please make it fun. And um, however you, th whatever point you think you are in this, um, uh, in your filmmaking career at the beginning, you've already done some. We always have found that the best way to go about it is just make a film from your heart and the rest will take care of itself. So we appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all so much. So, you know, we encourage you, be inspired, be creative, tell the story that you want to tell. Um, a pop-up will appear at the end of the webinar. It'll take you to a website for more details about the contest and uh, the, the festival. Uh, we've also posted an information sheet in the resource section here. Now, as a reminder, the uh, on-demand version of this webinar uh, will appear um, as a webcast. Uh, you'll be available about a day or so from now. The same link that was used to generate the webinar can be used to access the webcast. So on behalf of the United States Naval Institute and the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, the United States Naval Academy, uh, we hope you enjoyed the conference and we thank you for attending.